Being a pastor, um, I get the privilege and the opportunity to be involved in a lot of different weddings. Um, and over the last several years, I've had the opportunity to get involved in premarital counseling or wedding ceremonies, officiating weddings, or um, marriage counseling, all sorts of stuff. And so one of my favorite aspects of ministry is um, being able to pour into people, teach them the truths about God's scripture on marriage and what marriage is supposed to look like. And I love it. And um totally enjoy it. And I realized that the marriage business, our business in our, it wasn't only reserved for me and my family. Um, over the last several years, my two older kids have been in a ton of weddings. They have um, been ring bearers and flower girls. Um, Nicole was a flower girl. Tim was the ring bearer. Um, let's not create any confusion there. And, um, and they've been involved in a ton of different weddings. Um, in fact, there were weddings where I'm officiating, and both of them are walking down, and they all, um, Tim, when he was smaller, instead of going to his place, would actually run up to the stage where I was standing and just create an awkward moment, um, real confusion there. Um, and some of you guys know this, and some of you don't, but my wife, um, on the side, plans a ton of weddings. She's um, actually um, involved in getting weddings organized, and so the whole marriage thing is they've become a family quote-unquote business right and so we used to joke that if they brought me in to officiate the wedding and brought my wife in to coordinate the wedding we just throw the kids in for free and just let them be a part of the wedding and so but now the kids have gotten older and they're not that cute ring bearer and um, uh, flower girl age anymore and so we had to sit down and have a conversation and say what do we do? And that's the reason we have Micah now. And so there's hope for us to be able to continue into the future. Um, but watching Anne and coordinating weddings, there's some weddings where she's just there for the day of, and she just gets there, make sure the vendors are paid, make sure the bride's bridal party knows where to stand and when to walk, and they don't screw the day of um, ceremony up. And there are other weddings where she's involved in the intricate details of the ceremony. Right from the beginning, the moment the guy proposes and the girl says yes, she shows up and she's involved in helping them find locations and helping them find um, gowns and going with them to hotels and churches and intricate details of the marriage ceremony. Our story this morning picks up where a young couple is planning their wedding ceremony. It happens in a town called Nazareth involves a young lady by the name of Mary and a young guy by the name of Joseph. They have been recently engaged. Life can't get better. Things are working out. Everyone's excited. Wedding ceremonies in preparation. Super exciting, amazing moment in their lives. Life is good. She's found the man of her dreams. They're making plans for this wedding. And on a particular day in Nazareth, we don't know what Mary is doing. Maybe she's trying to get addresses to send wedding invitations out. Or maybe she's calling all the camel companies to find the best camel to go from the wedding ceremony to the reception. Who knows what she's doing? But it's a particularly normal, routine day in her life. Something very non-routine happens. An angel shows up. And he greets her. And he gives her this greeting, greetings, O highly favored one, God is with you. And the angel must have paused long enough because the Bible says that Mary was perplexed by that greeting. She didn't know what to do with that greeting. Greetings, O favored one, God is with you. She's in awe that the angel has greeted her this way. See, Mary grew up in an environment where she heard stories of her faith. She's heard stories about people, heroes of her faith, who have done great things for God. People like Noah and Moses and Abraham and David. These were the people that angels showed up to. These were the people that God showed up to and said, you're favored and God is with you. And here's Gabriel, the angel, standing in front of a teenager who's not yet married, who, does, who has her entire life to look forward to. And Gabriel shows up and gives her the exact same greeting that he gives to Moses and Noah and David and Abraham. You can understand why Mary is perplexed. She's heard stories about this. And here's God greeting her this way. She's stunned. But she hasn't heard anything stunning yet. Because what the angel next says, says next is that, listen, you're not married yet, but you have found favor in God's eyes 
and you're going to become pregnant, and the baby that you're carrying is going to be the Savior of the world. He's going to reign in David's throne forever, and he is going to bring redemption to everyone. The angel tells him, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. You're going to carry in you the one who is going to save people from their sins. Talk about stunning. This is far beyond stunning. Words can't even put into meaning what is going on in Mary's life. You think wedding planning is exciting. Now combine wedding planning with planning a nursery for the Savior of the world. This is stunning, staggering, shocking. And in a moment, Mary has a moment to pause and reflect, and it brings a question of curiosity or confusion. She wants to know, how can this be? I'm not married. And so she asked the angel a very simple question. How can this be because I'm a virgin? If Mary knows anything, right, Mar virgins don't have babies. That's not how babies show up. And she's not married. She's virgin. She wants to know, how in the world is this going to happen? And so the angel responds and says, listen, God makes impossible situations possible. And what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to be overshadowed by God. And you're going to have a child who's going to be called the Son of God. You're going to have a child, and he's going to be the Savior. And you have to be a virgin to make this possible because God makes impossible things possible so that this child can be called the Son of God. And it has to happen this way. It can't happen any other way. And you've got to ask the question, why does it have to be like that? Here's why. Think about it this way. There's a problem between God and us, and the problem is our sin. Every one of us in this room, we've sinned. We've messed up, and we've created this separation between God and us. We cannot relate to God. We can't be in friendship with God. We have been made enemies of God. Every one of us have messed up and not been able to live the sinless life that God demands from us. And because of our sin, we've been separated from him. It's not that God's hand is too short that he can't save us. It's not that his ear is too dull that he can't hear us. It's the fact that our sin has created this huge gap, this huge separation between God and us. So what we need is we need a mediator. We need someone who would come and bridge the gap between a perfect God and sinful humanities sinful me. And there's a problem because God's not man. And you and I can be honest, we're not God, right? I mean, and so there's a huge gap here. And we needed someone who could bring these two completely different parties together to the table. Jesus Christ is God who becomes flesh just like me just like you, born of a woman, conceived by the miraculous work of God so that Jesus can be fully God and he can be fully man and he can mediate between God and man by his death and resurrection for our sins that creates an avenue of peace between us and God. And that's how it had to be. Mary, who is a virgin, who's unmarried, is now going to be with child so that the Savior can mediate peace for me and for you with God. That's an amazing message. But if you think about it, this puts Mary into an incredible predicament. Here she is, young, unmarried, and now pregnant. And before we see how Mary responds, I want you to think about the situation that she's in. The scripture tells us a lot about the laws in which Mary lived under as a Jewish woman. The Old Testament speaks about things that would happen to people who had sexual relations outside of marriage. And Mary grew up in that culture. She knew the rules. She grew up in a strict environment to be found as a teenager who is engaged to be married, but now already pregnant out of wedlock, would be crushing for her life. 
In fact, one of the penalties of the Old Testament was that you would be stoned. Put yourself in this position. God comes to you and says that this is the way it's going to happen. You're going to get pregnant, but you're going to stay, remain a virgin. You're not going to get married. And this put Mary in a completely difficult scenario. How is she going to explain this? She's a teenager, engaged, pregnant, not married, in a strict culture that has terrible consequences for people that have sex outside of marriage. What is she going to say? I promise I didn't have sex. God did this, right? Who's going to believe her? God has put her in a situation where she is now going to face ridicule and questioning and misunderstanding and isolation, and people are just going to flat out call her a liar. Think about the situation that Mary's now in. The wedding plans now take a turn. In fact, the Bible says that Joseph, when he finds out, he actually wants to break off the engagement and have nothing to do with Mary. I mean, because if he continues on, people are going to look at him and say, he's the guilty party. And he knew he wasn't guilty. He didn't do anything wrong. She did. When you think about Mary's situation in the story, this is a difficult place that God has put her in. Incredible honor on one side to be the mother of the Savior of the world. But what difficulty to be able to live this out in front of her peers and family and friends. I love how Mary responds. If you have a, your Bible and if you have a pen, circle, highlight, underline verse 38. It is so powerful. Mary responds, Behold, I am your servant. Let it be according to your word. And as soon as she says that, the angel leaves. She says, no matter what this means for me, no matter what questions I have, no matter what I have to face because of this, no matter what lies in front of me, no matter what I understand or don't understand at this point, no matter what is going to happen to me, God, I trust you. I trust you with my life. It doesn't matter how difficult this is going to be. It doesn't matter how unimaginable this is going to be. It doesn't matter that I can't explain this to anyone in a way that they will believe me. God, I trust you with my life. I trust you. And we talked about the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth a few weeks ago when Jason spoke. I want you to just simply contrast how Zacharias responded when the angel told him that they were going to get pregnant to the way Mary responded. Here's Zacharias, who is daily in the presence of God, daily experiencing God, daily hearing God's voice. He knows scripture. He's got it memorized. He knows all about how God works. And the angel shows up and says, God's going to work in your life. He doubts. Here's Mary, a teenager, doesn't know how to read doesn't know what her future lies. She doesn't experience God. In fact, God has been silent for so long. And God speaks to Mary. And Mary says, whatever you say, do it because I trust you. Listen, can I, this is a side note. But there's a lot of us in this room that have grown up in church that we know everything about how God is supposed to work and how God is supposed to operate, that we're actually more like Zacharias that when God speaks, we're like, oh, that's not normal. That's not how God operates. And we miss God because we assume we know how God is supposed to work. What faith that this teenage woman who is facing incredible difficulty in her life has when she responds to God, God, I trust you with my life. Whatever this means for me, Whatever this looks like, if you said it, if you're the one speaking, I'm going to trust you. And I want you to see how God responds. He is so incredibly gracious to Mary. He gives her grace that she 
can't even imagine. Because in her announcement, the angel gives one more bit of news to Mary. He says, not only are you going to be pregnant with the Savior of the world, but you've got a cousin by the name of Elizabeth. By the way, Elizabeth has been barren for all of her life. Everyone ridicules her, and everyone knows her as the woman that couldn't have children. By the way, I'm doing something in her life. She's pregnant and just wanted you to know that. And Mary realizes that God gives this bit of information to her so that she can go and visit Elizabeth. And so what does she do? She packs her bags, gets on the road, and begins a three-day journey all the way to Judah to see Elizabeth. Can't you imagine what it's like for Mary to walk three days? Do you think her life was filled with anxiety? Is Elizabeth going to believe me? Yeah, everyone knows that what's happening in Elizabeth's life is a miracle. No way someone at her age can get pregnant. That's got to be a work of God. But how am I going to explain my situation? How am I going to explain to people that what's going on in my life is a God thing, not some sin that I've done? And yet when you read the story, you never find Mary filled with anxiousness or worry. If it was me, it was you. Our life would be full of anxiousness. Our life would be full of worry. We would be wondering, God, what are you going to do? And she's walking into the most difficult and trying circumstances of her life with absolute, complete peace. And she gets there. She greets Elizabeth. And the moment she greets Elizabeth, the baby in Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist, becomes filled with the Holy Spirit and leaps for joy. And Elizabeth gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And she begins to proclaim to Mary the very thing Mary was nervous about telling Elizabeth. Before Mary even speaks a word, she's saying, how am I going to tell Elizabeth I'm pregnant? Before she can even communicate that, Elizabeth communicates to her, oh yeah, you're pregnant. And you're pregnant with the Messiah. And you are highly favored. How do you think Mary felt at that time? before she had to say a word, before she had to communicate, God already took care of the details. She knew God was watching her. She knew God was taking care of her. And a sense of peace fell on her life. You know what? God took care of the other details as well. Her fiancé, Joseph, who planned to leave Mary, God sends an angel to him and says, hey, stick with this. This is God working. Marry her. Take care of her. This is me working. Joseph stays with Mary. Detail after detail, God takes care of her. And do you realize that Mary's circumstances doesn't get better after the baby's born? Do you know where they live after Jesus is born? In Nazareth, their hometown. So now she's living in the community that has ridiculed her, that has spread rumors about her, that has gossiped about her. Life doesn't get easier. But all you see in Mary and all you see in Joseph is complete peace and complete trust in God. And you got to ask the question, why? Why was she able to have complete peace? And the answer is found in verse 45. Verse 45 of Luke 1. It says, She believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken by God. See, the reason Mary had great peace and joy despite facing incredible ridicule and harassment is because she believed that if God said it, he'll be faithful to do it. She simply believed. Her faith was the conduit for experiencing the power and the peace of God that prevails over every circumstance. And it's the same conduit for our salvation. It is trusting in Jesus and your trust in God that brings peace to your life. I want you to notice something about our passage. Peace from God is not the absence of difficulty or tragedy or turmoil. See, sometimes we think that if 
God would take a certain someone out or if God would change our finances or if God would take care of some details, then we would have a peaceful life. But peace is not the absence of difficulties or trials or turmoil. Peace is a person. Peace is the living God. And it is his presence in the midst of any circumstance that provides true peace. You don't got to win the lottery. You don't have to have some miraculous change in your life. You don't have to be healed from every disease in your life. You don't have to avoid tragedy to be able to experience peace. At the same time, if you do get a financial breakthrough, if you were to have some promotion at work, or if you were to be able to pass all of your classes, or if you were to have some incredible situation work out in your life, that will not provide you true peace. Peace is a person. And his name is Jesus. I want you to notice in this passage that we see the presence of God in a way that we can understand how peace comes. First of all, God the Father makes a promise. He comes to Mary through the angel and says, you're going to have a child. This is my promise to you. And this child is going to be the savior of the world. God the Father makes a promise. And Jesus brings into reality every one of the promises that God has made for Mary and for me and for you. And then the Holy Spirit allows, in Elizabeth's life, confirms the promises of God. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit in Elizabeth's life that allows her to identify that God has promised this, that is made real in the person of Jesus. See, the promises that God are made, that God have made, is so that you can believe them, so that they can be real in your life, because Jesus died and rose again for your sins. And when Jesus ascended to the Father and is now in heaven, what he does is he sends the Holy Spirit to remind us that God has made promises and he is faithful to take care of them. That his peace is real for you right now because the Spirit of God is within you as you wait for Jesus, who's made the promises of God real for you. Peace is a person. Listen, that means every one of us have a decision to make. Whether you're a believer or a non-believer in this room, you have a decision to make. And the decision is, will you trust Jesus? Will you decide that no matter what happens, no matter what this means for me, no matter what questions I have, no matter what dilemma this might create, no matter what I understand or don't understand, I will trust you, God, fully with my life. See, if you will make the choice to trust in the promise of God, made real in the person of Jesus, experienced in your life by the presence of the Holy Spirit, if you will believe God in that manner, then God will bring things into your life, just like he did for Mary, that will bring peace into your life, despite what's going on in you or around you. When you trust in God, you enter into a relationship with him. And he does stuff in your life so that you will not doubt what he has said. But you will have faith that what he has said is true. And you will experience the blessings of knowing his peace and his promises are real. That's exactly what he did for Mary. That's exactly what he does for us. That we will trust him no matter what. Listen, if you don't trust in Jesus, there is no peace for you. There is no real peace true, genuine peace. Because the truth is that every single one of us have found ourselves in unimaginable circumstances. We've been separated from God. And the only way to get back right with God is by putting our faith in Jesus who died for us. If you want peace, there's only one way to get it. And that's through Jesus. Listen, this morning, if you have not trusted Jesus with your life, let me encourage you to trust him. He is faithful. 
He will take care of you. He will be your Savior. He will be with you. His Spirit will guide you. Trust Him with your life. And if you are a follower of Jesus, I want to challenge you this morning. Bank your life on the promises of God. Put all of your eggs in that one basket because He is faithful. Trust Him with your life. Trust him that he will do what he said because he is good and faithful. In Philippians 1, Paul writes that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. That's a promise of God. That promise is made reality because Jesus died for your sins and my sins. And we get to experience that promise because every day the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, changing us bit by bit, more by more, so that one day we will stand in front of Jesus looking like Jesus. God the Father made a promise. It's made real because of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is working so that you can experience peace and be light to the world. Second Peter 1.3 says that God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. Everything. Everything that you need, God has given to you. Listen, that's a promise from God that you can bank on. And that promise is made real because Jesus died for you and for me. And the reason we get to experience the reality of that promise is because the Holy Spirit is working in us every single day, showing us how to live our lives. See, but none of that will happen unless you trust God no matter what. It doesn't matter what tragedy happens. It doesn't matter what circumstances happen. It doesn't matter what questions you have. I will trust him because his promises are real. They're made real in Jesus, and I get to experience them on a daily basis because of the Holy Spirit. You know what? When you trust Jesus that way, when you trust God that way, you know what happens? You begin to shine as lights in darkness. And as you shine, people will see your peace. Because one of the things that Jesus said is, when I leave, one of the things I'm leaving with you is my peace. Peace, not, of the, not the way the world gives, but the peace that only I have is what I'm giving you. And listen, there is nothing in this world like the peace of God. Listen, that's, this morning as we are doing Advent and preparing for Christmas, this is what Christmas is all about. Those of us who have trusted in Jesus no matter what, shining with his peace to a world that desperately needs the peace of God. This morning... Reed prayed for the nation of Israel, a land that is full with turmoil. There's no peace there. But we don't have to look all the way out there to the Middle East to find that that's the only area that doesn't have peace. Walk outside these doors. You see people that have no peace. You see people whose life is in despair. Christmas is about the life of God changing you, filling you with the Holy Spirit so that your light would shine so bright and your life would be so different and the peace of God would overflow from your life so that those that don't have peace will experience peace because they're with you and because in you is Jesus the Savior. This morning, if you don't have peace, it's because you're not trusting the promises of God in your life. It's because you don't trust that God is faithful to take care of the details of your life. So let me invite you. The greatest evidence that God will take care of you is right there when we celebrate the table. Because what that table shows us is that God will take care of our biggest need, our sin problem. That if God can take care of our sin issue, 
He can take care of the other issues. God can take care of your life. He can take care of your future. It might not work out the way that you dreamed or imagined it to be, but if you are trusting him, it will work out exactly the way he wants for your life. He is faithful. I'm sure Mary never sat and imagined, oh, one day I'm going to get pregnant out of wedlock, and I'm going to walk around and tell people that God did this. Right? But when God is involved, he will bring you honor and he will take care of the details of your life. This morning, we're coming to the communion table. If you know Jesus this morning, this table is a reminder that everything you have in life is because of him. Because he bled and shed his life for you, you have been forgiven. You have been given love and joy and peace. All of that has been given to you. So when you come to the table this morning, if you are not trusting God with your life, can I plead with you? Bank your life on Jesus. Trust him with your life. Your dreams might fail. Your aspirations might not work out the way you dreamed it to be. But when you say, God, no matter what, I trust you. No matter what, I believe you. Do with me as you please. Listen, he will do some amazing things in your life. But it really comes down to, do you trust him? Do you trust him? As we come to the table, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart. Examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. Are there areas in your life where you can clearly see, God, I really don't trust you with this? I don't trust you with my family. I don't trust you with my health. I don't trust you with my children. I don't trust you with my finances. The Holy Spirit will show it to you because, listen, he wants to make you more like Jesus. He'll reveal that to you this morning. And if he does, would you repent? Because not only do we have a God that shows us where where we need to repent, but he graciously offers his help. And he's here this morning offering help. And he says, just run to me. Come to me. I'm here. Father, this morning, as we come to this table, we acknowledge that you are faithful. That every promise that you said is made real to us because of Jesus. And that we get to experience them today because God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of us. So, Father, I pray Forgive us for not listening to you. Forgive us for not trusting you. Help us this morning to say, God, whatever you may do, whatever you will say, whatever you tell me, I will trust you. And as we do, would you allow us to shine, shine so bright so that the world that doesn't have peace We'll experience the peace of Jesus. We love you.